chocolate, which is way cool. Uh, now, those of you that are not here for extra credit, how many of you are here for chocolate samples? Yeah, see? All right. And all the other hands go up. Um, I will be placing, Andy was kind enough to bring a whole bunch of samples with him, and uh, I will be on the way out so we don't have everybody hopped up on chocolate during. So it's all about planning. So will you please join me in welcoming Andy McShane. Thank you very much and uh, I think tonight we're going to talk a little bit about chocolate science and what makes chocolate tick. Uh, it's very nice to be here. It's uh, warm. It's been very cold in Seattle so uh, it's a very welcome change. So we're going to talk tonight about chocolate and uh, what makes chocolate tick. And for those of you that have forgotten, chocolate is the fruit of a tree. It comes from the, the ground fermented uh, fruit straight seeds of Theobroma cacao. And Theobroma cacao, that's the Latin name for the chocolate tree, translates as the food of the gods. And it's also where we got the name Theo chocolate from as well. It's to remind people of where your food came from. And of course, it's very, very delicious, although I wouldn't eat quite as much as this lady here. Uh, if any of you do ever get to Seattle, please come and visit us. We have a factory that does factory tours seven days a week. And uh, we have a lovely facility, and we, we pull lots of people through. Uh, obviously, you can't see it tonight, but these are some photographs, and we're going to look at a few photographs of the factory tonight. And uh, it's in a lovely old building in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle. And we make uh, pretty much exclusively organic uh, chocolate at uh, this factory. We make uh, dark chocolate and milk chocolate, and then a couple of special varieties of chocolates from certain regions. And then we also take these chocolates and we put all sorts of fun things into them and make some very delicious treats. And we're having a very good day today because we just won some bigger walls. So uh, if you see our stuff out and about around town, you should try it. I did just hear that the, uh, the fresh market down the road is about to stock our material, so uh, uh, that's good news if you're interested in trying our chocolate. So let's talk about how chocolate goes from being a fruit to the finished chocolate bar so everyone can sort of understand the process. It's a little bit complicated, and then we'll get into, the, to, into some other fun stuff. So it starts with uh, cocoa and the cocoa tree, the Abrama cacao. This tree grows within 20 degrees, plus minus the equator. So this is a, is a tropical plant, much more tropical than it is here. Uh, so this is somewhere uh, where the tree grows, where it's pretty warm. And we take the cocoa, uh, uh, and it is harvested from these pods. You can see the pods on the tree trunk there. And uh, if you break open those pods, you'll see that those pods are full of big seeds. They're about the size of an almond, perhaps a little bit bigger. And those seeds are then taken out of those pods and they're fermented. Now, we're not talking fermented like Anheuser-Busch fermented. That's a big sort of fancy industrialized process for making beer. We're talking about a much simpler uh, uh, setup here where the fermentation is either carried out in wooden boxes or in banana leaves. And it's a very complete fermentation. It goes all the way taking the, the sugars that are in, the, uh, uh, in and around the cocoa beans taking them all the way from that state right through to acetic acid. And there's lots of fermented foods that we eat, so this isn't anything too strange. Uh, this is like uh, sauerkraut or something like that. It's a very similar process. So we uh, uh, start by taking the fruit from the tree, ferment the seeds, go through the fermentation process, and you can see here a slide of what a fermented cocoa seed looks like, or a cocoa bean looks like. If you, if you cut them in half, you can look at them. And the ones on the left are under-fermented. And if you eat under-fermented chocolate, not only does it taste pretty harsh, it has a pretty unpleasant taste to it, it will also be very purple. And uh, chocolate that's been properly fermented, uh, on the right-hand side, has a sort of a, a seeds with a, a, a sort of a brown color to them. So it's a sort of a, a, a process that the, the cocoa bean has to go through in order to generate some of the flavors that we know as chocolate. So how does this happen? Well, we do a lot of roasting. This is actually our facility uh, in Seattle. We take the cocoa beans and we roast them. The object on the left there is a very old roaster. It's from about the late 1930s. We take the cocoa beans 
And just like you would do coffee, will roast those cocoa beans to develop the flavor. If you don't roast the cocoa beans, it doesn't taste quite as good. So we go through a roasting process, we'll roast the cocoa beans, and then the machine on the right will remove a thin shell. There's just a very thin shell that's on the outside of the cocoa bean. We'll take all of that material that we've roasted, and we'll grind it together. Chocolate making has lots of grinding steps in it. We're going to take those roasted cocoa beans, grind them together with a little bit of sugar, and then what we're going to do is slow cook it. And uh, this is called conching. Uh, it's a technical name for the process. And what we're doing here is we're basically slow cooking the chocolate uh, at relatively high temperature, up to about 70 or 80 degrees C. And we're also applying lots of shear, lots of mixing. And as we slow cook the chocolate, the flavors from the fermentation, some of those disappear, and some other flavors appear that we know and relate to being the flavors that we like in chocolate. And so there's lots of grinding, some roasting, some slow cooking. There's a lot of processing in chocolate. Now, in order to go from liquid chocolate to solid chocolate, we have to go through a few more processes. We have to temper the chocolate. If you've ever tried uh, working with chocolate in, uh, at home, for those bakers at home, you'll know that you need to temper chocolate. For those of you that haven't, for the men in the room, uh, if you take a <laughs> chocolate bar and you leave it in your car, and you get it, it melts, and you then try and put it in the fridge or somewhere cool to try and put it back into the solid state, it just doesn't work. And that's because the chocolate bar is out of temper, and the fats will not recombine with the solids properly unless the chocolate's retempered, so you can't just rescue the chocolate bar by cooling it down. So we have to do a process that's somewhat complicated that allows the chocolate bar uh, to go into the right state. We have to crystallize the chocolate, and then we put it into molds, and uh, we, we take that uh, molded material, we cool it slowly, and then we take the chocolate bars out of the molds. And you can see here the molds coming out of the molding machine. So, a couple of things we're going to learn about tonight. I think we've got a quick view on how we make chocolate. I'm going to talk about the economics of chocolate, and I promise it won't be boring. I never liked economics as a kid, but this is kind of interesting. We'll talk about the pharmacology of chocolate, what it does to you, and why chocolate's fun, and why it's interesting. We'll talk about the chemistry that underlies the chocolate, and I promise I won't make that too boring. I was never a fan of chemistry as a kid, and it sort of grew on me with time, and I'll explain why, and I'll make it very, very easy and fun. Okay, so let's talk about cocoa and where it originated. So, so the first evidence of cocoa goes back 3,400 years, 113 generations ago. And we look at this, and we say, well, how do they know this? Well. There were some pottery fragments found in northern Honduras which contain the signature of chocolate. Chocolate has a very, very unique chemical signature. And how this was discovered is basically a bunch of chemists got together with a bunch of physicists and they tried to figure out how they could tell what the, the, the molecular composition of something was. And they came up with a technique called liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy, which basically means analyzing the chemical makeup of any particular material using a very complicated machine and an atom batter, batter similar to what's done here. And they were able to identify a compound known as theobromine in these pottery fragments that would carbon dated back to this very, very old uh, period, which goes back to the Olmec civilization in Honduras. And they believe this is the first evidence of people trying to consume cocoa. In other words, it was in a pottery vessel. They must have been doing something with it. And uh, there were fragments of what looked like little pieces of cocoa in there. Now, cocoa originally um, came from the Amazon basin. That's quite a change. Modern cocoa these days comes from West Africa. But the origin of the, of the cocoa plant is actually northern, the northern half of South America. And so cocoa has really migrated across the globe as it has become a, a farmed and, and grown product. And so it's sort of moved around. There's a number of different types of cocoa. Uh, most people uh, group cocoa into three major groups. It turns out with a little more analysis, there's more like 10. So there's lots of different types and flavors of chocolate that are out there. But we generally see only one. We see chocolate, which is kind of a sort of generically blended material. But there are actually lots and lots of different flavors of chocolate uh, that can be had if you know where to find them. Okay, so let's just cover a little bit of history. So first evidence of cocoa drinks goes back to 1340 BC. 
1502, so this is almost 3,000 years later, Columbus uh, lands in Nicaragua looking for a route to India. There's no Panama Canal at the time, so he's, he's gone the wrong way. But uh, that, was, that was just one of those things. And he discovers Aztecs uh, consuming cocoa drinks and using cocoa beans, the things I showed you, the purple thing earlier on, using those as currency. They were actually using them as a form of coinage. So a very, very different world to what we do now. We, we now eat our money, uh, but in those days they were actually using it to buy things. Now, in 1520, Hernando Cortes, and this was part of the sort of the Spanish, uh, shall we say, exploration of the uh, uh, of the of the uh, of the um, that bit between North America and, and South America. My apologies. And uh, he brought uh, came to Spain. And his interest was in cultivating money on trees. His logic was, the Aztecs are using it, then I can grow money on trees, because if those guys are using it and they're using it as currency, I can bring it back to Spain and be rich. Interesting idea, didn't really work out for him. But you'll notice one thing here. Nobody was using cocoa beans to make chocolate. That wasn't until 1847, when a gentleman by the name of Joseph Fry in Bristol, which is the town that Coincidentally, I, I was born in, when Joseph Fry invented the first chocolate bars, the first solid form of chocolate. Up until that date, it had been drunk, consumed in some sort of frothy beverage, or it had been used as a currency. So a very, very different, a different uh, uh, and, and varied history to what one might expect. Now, of course, there was one caveat to that. And it wasn't until 30 years later <laughs> that the Swiss actually took the British invention and made it taste good. <laughs> now, I don't say anything about British food, but... Uh, so, so and, and, and the thing that, the, that Joseph Fry had forgotten to do, or he, it hadn't occurred to him, was uh, this process called conching. Remember I talked about slow cooking earlier on? If you don't slow cook the cocoa mush that you've made, then it doesn't taste as good. And this was invented by a gentleman whose name is still very famous today, by a gentleman of, uh, called Rudolf Lindt. And Rudolf Lindt, you can go to a store and you can buy Lindt's chocolate, right? Mm -hmm. So Rudolf Lindt was the guy who was credited with coming up with this process of transforming British food into something that you actually want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much, people, how much chocolate do you think people eat a year? It's a lot. It's actually a crazy amount. The Swiss consume over 25 pounds a year of chocolate. The US about half that, about 12 pounds a year. Uh, we eat a lot of chocolate. Um, most, uh, most sort of northern hemisphere uh, countries consume somewhere between 10 and about 25 pounds a year. So that has led to about a harvest size of 3.4 million tons of cocoa being harvested every year. That's a lot of cocoa, 3.4 million tons. That's, that's a huge, staggering uh, quantity of cocoa. Most of the cocoa these days comes out of West Africa. So the small red portion there, uh, uh, down on the, uh, in the middle of the diagram. Uh, if you look at that area, you can see that uh, that comprises the Ivory Coast and Ghana, which are the primarily some of the larger producers in terms of cocoa. There's some cocoa produced in Indonesia and also in uh, northern South America, although these guys uh, have had some problems with pests and problems with their crop. But cocoa has, been, has gone from being something that was a very important cultural significance back in the Aztec era to something that has become, uh, really frankly, big business. So talking of big business, who's this guy? Does anyone know who this guy is? It's been, a, it's been a crazy year in chocolate, so the last, the last 12 months have been very crazy. This tough guy here is trouble. So th this, this guy here is trouble. In, um, his name's Anthony Ward, and uh, uh, last July, he decided he was just going to buy everything. He's, a, he's a, a, a hedge fund trader, he has large amounts of money. And uh, he went out and he attempted to buy 250,000 tons of cocoa. He bought everybody's cocoa. He bought the entire crop harvest. And, and this wasn't a random event, he's done it before. <laughs> and he was attempting to squeeze the market. And he did it because the cocoa prices, a bit like the oil prices, have gone crazy. 
So cocoa has gone from being $1,800 a ton, and it was $3,800 a ton a few weeks ago. That's crazy differences in pricing. So all of a sudden, our food is becoming very, very expensive. What was a commodity that was relatively stable has become quite unstable. And what we have now is we have some uh, people who are in there trying to make a lot of money by, by buying low and selling high, essentially. And this isn't always a good thing in food. It may work in other spaces. It might work in gold. Uh, it's not a great thing, but it's our food stuff. So, so it's an interesting, uh, interesting thing uh, going on. And uh, I don't believe that one should play with food. So. No, we don't want commodity trading in chocolate. Thank you. Um, does that matter in the US? Who cares about chocolate in the US? Why would we care about chocolate in the US when most of it is imported? Uh, there is actually a little bit in Hawaii. Well, the answer is, for every one dollar of cocoa that's imported, one to two dollar of other ingredients are used. 1.5 million tons of US sugar is used, 650 million pounds of milk, and a quarter of all US peanuts are associated with chocolate that's imported into the US. That's why we care. It's a big driver for certain parts of the US economy. Not all parts, but certain parts. And it's, it's had a sort of a strange and muddled history. So in 1850, uh, folks were digging up crude oil, and, 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 and crude oil eventually became this sort of commodity. Um, but in the modern day, crude oil has sort of become something that we relate to plastics and energy and something that's very, very important to life. In 1850, for cocoa, uh, this eccentric British gentleman had just made the first chocolate bars that didn't really taste very good. And, and you know, over 100 years later, we're looking at candies and chocolate, so it hasn't really moved a lot. And one of the things that's very, very interesting right now in terms of science is people are trying to understand whether there's something else to chocolate and whether it has other properties that are kind of interesting. We might have missed something, in other words. Is there something in chocolate that's a little more mysterious uh, and, and could be uh, something worth looking at? And this is really the problem. What we have right now in modern chocolate uh, that is, that is uh, sort of the mass produced stuff is that chocolate and the flavor of cocoa sort of slipped down the list of ingredients and it's sort of lost in all of the goo uh, that has become modern food. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat things that were invented by accountants. I want to eat good food. I want to eat things that are fun and interesting and put together by people who care and uh, uh, not by people that care about the bottom line. So, um, we're interested in looking at what sort of things are in chocolate. And what are they? Well, there are some interesting effects that chocolate have, has on people. Firstly, it reduces blood pressure. It does this quite well. Now, we need to differentiate a few things here. I'm not talking about super, super sweet chocolate that's full of sugar. I'm talking about chocolate that has very high levels of cocoa in it. Okay? We're not talking about a very cheap candy bar, we're talking about chocolate that's, that's got a very high concentration of cocoa. Uh, it's a vasodilator, so it drops your blood pressure, your blood vessels essentially open up a little. It's anti-inflammatory. It's a cough suppressant that occurs by a different mechanism. Uh, it's a mood elevator, could be because you're eating some sugar too. Uh, it's actually a potent antibiotic. Did you know that chocolate, if you took the sugar out, it would be very good for your teeth? not good for your teeth with a load of sugar in it, but, you know, if you took the sugar out, it's actually good for the teeth. And the fun thing with all of these, I don't know about you, but most of these things in medicine don't taste very nice if you had to take them in some sort of pill form. Uh, it is interesting that you can consume foods that have positive effects on you that actually can taste good as well. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what happens to you when you consume chocolate, because I'm sure a lot of people want to know. You get this big buzz, right? Well, that could be because you're also consuming a lot of sugar. That's why we put everything outside. So we'll get to that soon. I won't talk too long. So, so um, uh, chocolate, it gives you a little bit of a buzz. Why does it do that? Let's look at the chemistry in chocolate. So chocolate contains a small amount of something called theobromine and an even smaller amount of something called caffeine. Caffeine, we know what that is. Caffeine, that's, that's what's in coffee. That's what's in in espresso and coffee and coke and all of these things that gives you just a little bit of a sort of a, you know, gets you going a little bit. Theobromine is very closely related. Look at the, look at the, the structures on the wall there. And you'll notice the only difference is the methyl group on the left-hand side that I've circled in red. 
Theobromine and caffeine are very closely related. They have similar effects. And theobromine is a mild stimulant. It doesn't give you the jingles. It doesn't, doesn't wake you up in the morning. But it does have a mild stimulating effect on the body. And this is, this is in measurable quantities in chocolate. And uh, it's certainly thought to be one of the things that sort of gives you a bit of get up and go when you eat a chocolate bar. So what about taste? There's lots of things in chocolate. And what makes chocolate taste good? Well, that's an interesting story. That has taken a lot of time to figure out. And what I try to do is I try to condense about 15 years of very boring organic chemistry into one slide. The slide's a little bit complicated, but bear, bear with me here. So, components of flavor. We're going to talk chemistry here in the middle of the physics lab. Um, and what this is, is uh, sort of a little radar chart. Uh, the further you are away from the middle, the higher the concentration. And then you can see, just like the points on a clock, there are different uh, chemicals at each uh, position around the dial of the clock. And then you can see that these, these sort of colored areas go towards them. And so if you look at the very top, look at noon at 12 o'clock, you can see that theobromine is up there. Remember theobromine, the stimulant I was talking about? Well, guess what? It contributes to the flavor. So part of the flavor of chocolate, and think about this, this makes, this makes sense. It's, to, it's a protective mechanism. Humans taste what they eat to tell us about what we're eating, right? It's a safety thing. We, we don't eat things that taste very bad. It's to protect us. So we can perceive the taste of certain chemistries in our food. Theobromine and caffeine contribute to some of the bitter flavors in chocolate. And then if we, for instance, look at uh, the light, the light blue, the cyan over there, you can see that sucrose contributes to the flavors of cocoa. You can see some very simple sugars contribute to the flavors. On the right-hand side in red, on the, towards 3 to 6 o'clock, you can see that citric acid, citric acid, lactic acid, these are very simple acids that are very common in food. They contribute to some of the sourness, some of the fruity tastes that are in chocolate. And if we look here on the 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock segment here, uh, it says purple astringent. These are mouth drying, mouth puckering flavors. You know if you put something like um, some of these um, uh, I'm think sort of, uh, uh, powdered things in your mouth, it will sort of dry your mouth out. Okay. There are some chemistries in chocolate that do a similar thing. And these chemistries are labeled here, and the names are epicatechin, catechin, and procyanidin. They're rather complicated names, but what they are, are those are important antioxidants that are in chocolate. Those are the things that lower your blood pressure. And so there's one very interesting message here, in that, yes, there's some fascinating chemistry, but you can taste some of the important chemistry in chocolate. It, it is part of the flavor. Now, if you're really brave, and I could never face organic chemistry, you can study this sort of stuff. But I really, <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't do that in college, and I ended up becoming a biologist initially. And um, chocolate contains lots of polyphenols. And uh, if you look at number eight, that complicated structure there, uh, that particular procyanidin is part of a family of molecules that exist in all sorts of healthy things, like tea, uh, chocolate, and a number of other fruits and vegetables have these types of chemistries in them. It's thought that these protect the plants, and they serve a useful property in the plants, but humans like them as well, and they're generally, generally good for you. Uh, they're antimicrobial. We don't need to get into all of the data, but, but the, most, of these, most of these compounds will actually inhibit the growth of nasty bugs in you. Uh, think about this. This is kind of logical. If you're a plant in the ground, and the ground is full of bacteria, right? We'll all agree with that. You need to wash your hands after you've been handling the earth. Um, the plants protect themselves by secreting small amounts of antibiotics, and most of those antibiotics are polyphenols. So you can actually, to some degree, I'm not saying you, you can't cure an infection, but it's not a bad thing to consume lots of healthy, well-cleaned, uh, fresh veg and fruit because it's also a source of natural polyphenols that are naturally inhibitory to microbial growth. And some of these polyphenols, they, they'll actually uh, inhibit the growth of nasty things like salmonella and things that are really cause you some problems. So interesting, interesting chemistry in chocolate. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about antioxidants. Okay, in order to understand antioxidants, it helps if you understand what an oxidant is or an oxygen radical. Oxygen radicals are things that we're exposed to during our lifetime. Unfortunately, as oxygen falls apart, typically it does this in a way that causes us problems, and that causes us damage to our tissues, it makes us age. Uh, typically, you can get this from a variety of sources. It could be industrial, it could be doing bad things like smoking, which is never a good idea. Uh, it could be a little bit of background radiation. It could be UV light. We don't have a problem with UV light in Seattle, so normally, normally that's not, not a consideration. Uh, and it can also come from your own body. The, the bad news is that if you breathe oxygen, you're going to be exposed to some sort of oxygen oxidative stress. And since we all require oxygen, that's, that's a bit of a given in our lifetime. So we've been told that what we should do is we should eat lots of fruits and vegetables, because they contain lots of fiber, and they have natural antioxidants. Those antimicrobial polyphenols that I showed you in very complicated chemistry, most of that chemistry can absorb these can absorb these bad guys, they can absorb the oxygen radicals, and they're present in this type of food stuff. The reality, of course, is this type of food stuff isn't quite so fun. We get tempted, we have a burger, a burn, or a, in this case, burn some sausages on the grill, and we consume uh, foods that are not so good for us. And so uh, consuming things that have uh, uh, materials in them that can mop up the oxygen radicals is a good thing. They come with a plant. Uh, generally, the types of antioxidants vary with the type of plant. They impart color, and so they can, they can, they can sometimes color the plant. The plants uh, will have pigments to them. And often they impart a taste, and we saw that earlier on. I was explaining how some of those antioxidants have sort of a, a bitter flavor to them, and they're part of the flavor of something that is natural. And if you look at a chocolate bar, we don't need to go into this in great detail, but if you measure these antioxidants, you can find them at very high levels in the chocolate bar. Uh, and that's not really surprising, because the chocolate bar consists of ground fermented seeds. You're basically eating uh, a plant material. Now, as you mess with the chocolate, and as you dilute the chocolate, not surprisingly, this chemistry becomes less and less. And modern chocolate bars, unfortunately, have become very, very diluted. So the original Aztec um, uh, reports, and there are actually written reports from this from 15 and 1600, uh, describe the consumption of cocoa beverages. And here they were consuming cocoa at very, very high concentrations. A modern cheap chocolate bar, a candy bar, can have 5 to 15% cocoa in it. It can have a very, very low uh, concentration of cocoa. So what you're mostly eating is sugar. So what we, 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 we want to consume, if we want to eat very dark chocolate, is we're looking for something that has a high percentage of cocoa. Something like 70, 80, 90 percent. It tastes pretty brutal when it gets up to about 100 uh, percent. It's kind of a quiet taste. <laughs> so, not all chocolate is, is good for you, unfortunately. Um, the most straightforward way of looking at this is this. Dark chocolate is better than milk chocolate. And then there's a process called dutching, which is a process we don't use. It's a, it's a chemical process. Uh, it's used to, to uh, rapidly conch. Remember that? Remember that slow cooking process? You can do that with a different method called dutching. And uh, unfortunately, what that does is it damages the chemistry of chocolate. And then there's mocklet, which is just a rather rude way of saying chocolate that looks like chocolate, but it, it's brown, but it's not really chocolate. And then, unfortunately, saddest of all, white chocolate. I'm very sad, sorry to say so, but white chocolate really isn't that, you know, full of antioxidants. Anymore. It does taste good, though, so I will say that. So, not all chocolate is equal, um, and uh, that's something that's uh, uh, sort of worth wrapping your head around. So, very, very dark chocolates have high levels of antioxidants, and uh, white chocolate, nothing at all, unfortunately. So, don't eat bad chocolate. Uh, I think that's, I think that's a fairly well-made point. Uh, there's lots of bad chocolate out there. This is a real brand. Like it. It is? This is not, yeah, I don't think this is from an from a, 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 a English-speaking nation. So, just to sort of wind up, 
So real chocolate contains meaningful bioactive chemistries. There's antioxidants in there, there's some antimicrobials in there, there's lots of interesting things in chocolate. Antioxidants are part of the flavor of chocolate. Your body tells you what is good and what is bad to eat. In the same way, you can actually uh, taste the, the different flavors, and they'll actually, uh, when you're tasting something that's complex and interesting from a plant, uh, there is a reason for it. It's there, your body's trying to tell you something about what you're eating. The effects of, on physiology, of co uh, uh, the effects of your physiology of cocoa are good for you, and they're tangible. And I always like to sort of go back to what my mother said, which is, don't eat it if you don't know where it came from. And this has really become a very, very important thing. So if you go out to a supermarket, or let's say a gas station, which is not known for its culinary prowess, you go to the gas station across the road, and, and, and you go there, a lot of the products there have all sorts of weird things on them, and all sorts of weird additives. If you don't understand what those additives are, don't eat them. That's my, that really is my philosophy, and I, I spend a lot of time looking at food chemistry, and I like to keep things simple. So there's a lot of crazy stuff out there. If you don't understand what it is, at the very least, go look it up on Google or whatever and figure out what on earth you're eating, because it's kind of important. There's lots of food additives, and a lot of them are used by the cost accountants. It's really an exercise in accountancy and making things, making things uh, cheap and efficient to make. It's not necessarily something that you really want to be putting in your body. So, I'll finish off with this. So is chocolate a food? Is it a medicine? Is it a bit of both? Who knows? Who knows? I'll end with this slide. It depends on your perspective. And everyone has a different perspective. <laughs> Theobromine. So theobromine, remember the lady with the rather bulging eyes? 
so so uh, the slide after that was a slide looking at theobromine. This particular chemistry is relatively prevalent in chocolate, and humans can easily get rid of it. We metabolize it just the same as we metabolize caffeine. Our livers <coughs> process this material. Unfortunately, dogs and cats, they lack the chemistry to transfer that material. And one of the things that happens that's very unfortunate is people get excited about the taste of chocolate and they want to feed it to their pet. It's a very bad idea. Um, some pets are more sensitive than others, depending on their variety of things, a general state of health. Um, but if they get a high enough dose of theobromine, it can actually be lethal for dogs. And so that's why you don't feed dogs chocolate. And it's, it's that chemistry. It's the same chemistry that humans actually seek out because it's this kind of interesting thing that makes them feel you know, a little bit sort of excited, a little bit like coffee, but a mild of sort of, of coffee. It's that same chemistry. It's not good for dogs. Also, why is there no bromine in free theobromine? I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I've got some, there's too many hands. Can I have, can you, can you pick? Uh, <laughs> there. Possibly. Um, I think, I think one needs to keep this in perspective. And, and the answer is, yes, there are chemistries in chocolate that are turning out to be very useful for the treatment of serious diseases. Can you treat cancer with chocolate bar? No. I think the, the, the two things, I think, and I'm always very, very, uh, you know, realistic about these things. But the chemistry of chocolate is wildly complex. And there, there are a number of groups, even as we're talking the last 12 months, the last 24 months, that have identified some really cool chemistries in chocolate that have a lot of promise for that type of application. Somebody was very noisy. Who are the noisy people? Oh, they just appeared. Okay, you, sir. Um, why didn't you decide to sell Why did you decide to sell chocolate? Why not? Isn't it <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Yes, um, it's, it's, the, the chocolate's actually kind of a small world. Um, there's a few chocolate scientists, probably a small group of us, and I thought it was fun, and, and I got the opportunity to do it, and I took it. And the science of chocolate's fun. Uh, we have a chocolate factory that is about 55 people right now, and it is some of the most talented, high-end energy people I've ever worked with my entire life. And our goal is to try and teach people about chocolate and, and buy the best quality cocoa and look after the cocoa farmers and bring all of that to, uh, to everyone else. And it's great fun. Really, why not, I think. <laughs> yes? Very, very good, very good question. So the, the, in part, some of the cornering of the market that was occurring last year was possibly likely to be associated with speculating that the cocoa supply was going to be cut off. And indeed it was. And that represents somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of the world's cocoa supply. And there was a blazing round between uh, Lauren Bagbo and Alessandra Watara, who had had an election, but uh, Mr. Bagbo didn't want to recognize the election results. And there was a lot of complicated stuff going on. Uh, unfortunately, things got very nasty, and it tried to descend into civil war. And we are still looking at the aftermath of that of that uh, outbreak. The Ivory Coast is not a very uh, stable place. Uh, it has unfortunately been ravaged by everything from colonialism to to sort of large companies trying to make a lot of profit. And uh, it's a place that could frankly do with a lot of investment, given how much cocoa it makes for the world. So, so uh, we'll, we'll see. The supply was cut off. We, as a company, do not purchase cocoa from the Ivory Coast. Currently, there are no organic and fair trade certified producers in the Ivory Coast. There are fair trade certified co-ops, but there's no organic and fair trade. So, generally speaking, that, that they don't meet our criteria. We would love to find groups, however, that are interested in doing that and trying to, to, uh, trying to develop those types of businesses. Because if we can build meaningful and sustainable businesses for people out of cocoa, we'd like to do that. Yes? As a long-standing chocoholic, I have discovered that the chocolate today 
does not have the uh, texture in your mouth that it used to, like, you know, you just cling there, and today it seems to be it's like more oily. Yeah. And, um, not nearly as appealing as it used to be. Yeah, it's sad. Um, there's sort of, you know, there's, you know, to be really cynical, and I think I will be, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of cost pressure on on, uh, uh, on chocolate products, and that's in part because of supply instability uh, in, in things uh, in places like the Ivory Coast. Um, meanwhile, the Europeans have sort of engineered chocolate into I bought a German chocolate bar today, and it was it was perfect in every way except it was totally unremarkable. Uh, it was it was a fascinating sort of letdown for my palate. Um, I, I think the answer comes from the use of emulsifiers. There are two emulsifiers that are heavily used in chocolate. One of them is soy lecithin. And uh, I don't know that most of you know this, but most chocolate in the world has soy products in it, uh, which, is, which is not really how I want to eat soy. If I want to eat soy, I'll eat soy. Uh, uh, and we don't put soy lecithin. We don't put any, anything else in our chocolate unless we pull it out of the label. And another product that's become very commonly used, especially in the last two years, and again, this speaks to how food is changing, is polyglycerol, polyresin oleate, which is lovely sounding stuff, usually abbreviated to PGPR on the package. And this is another emulsifier. Uh, it's used because of people having soy allergies, and it's used as a castor oil derivative. Both of these chemistries uh, make it cheaper to make chocolate. That's why they're used in mass manufacturing but they have the effect that it doesn't stick to your palate in the same way, and it's kind of oily. Yes. And what I worry about is that people will see this as the norm, and 20 years from now, everyone will look at real chocolate and go, well, what's this? I, I don't know what this is. I, I'm used to something that melts instantaneously in my mouth, and it's already happening. So I think that's a very, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite scary. So it's, it's, it's one of those things, and, and it comes because People are uh, sort of distracted, and there's a lot going on in their lives, but they should pay attention to what they eat. If you want to eat a refined you know, chemistry out of castor oil, by all means, purchase something that has PGPR in it. Uh, if you go to the gas station across the road, again, great culinary experience, but it's, it's sort of the cutting edge for cheap food, uh, you'll go across there, and if you look on those little labels, you usually have to lift, lift, the, lift the label up a little bit, and you'll see it says PGPR, you'll see other chemistry like uh, TBHQ, which is turbic butyl hydroquinone, which is a preservative. It keeps the nuts fresh so that they can sit in the gas station in the wrapper for three or four years. As long as, as, long as, as, long as those rotating wieners last four in there, they want to keep the chocolate good for that. Yes? Uh, it would be very, very expensive. Uh, I have seen greenhouse-grown cocoa, and uh, literally the, th the thing has to grow next to steam pipes. This is really a very, very tropical crop, and there are small plantations in Hawaii, uh, but there are also countries that have uh, transformed some of their economics and done a good job with cocoa. It's not all a horror story. There are some places where they have developed stable plantations and do uh, good business with cocoa. Um, there's some, some of the Central American countries are doing pretty well. Uh, some of the, some, a few sites in Indonesia are doing quite well. Um, we're involved with a lot of programs ourselves as a, as a small chocolate maker trying to promote uh, sustainable business where we believe that we can ensure that the farmers get paid a good price and that they can develop something sustainable in terms of growing a crop that makes a difference. We're actually involved in a project right now in the eastern Congo. If you remember, the eastern Congo was ravaged by the, by the entire um, Rwandan genocide, essentially. And cocoa is a crop that grows very readily there. We're looking to try and export some of that material. So there are there are some there are there are some glimmers of hope in cocoa. It does provide a useful income for some people. Um, and I don't think yes, if it gets that bad, I don't think we're going to be able to grow it in a greenhouse. How do you build a good chocolate bar? It just says sixty percent. What other ingredients should you see? As few as possible. <laughs> so, 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 I want to say a couple of things. I think.
think there's lots of good chocolate out, out there. I think we happen to make a nice chocolate bar. There are, there are a few others that make good chocolate bars. I think the defining feature of chocolate is, is how few ingredients it has. It has relatively few ingredients. That's a good thing. Uh, it's nice if it's organic certified. That helps. The National Organic Program standards put a very high bar on traceability of ingredients and quality of ingredients, essentially, that, that, that prevent you know, dodgy things from happening with the food. Those types of things help. But also, food is very subjective. So to some degree, it's up to you as the consumer to explore and enjoy and try stuff out and find stuff you like. Yes? This kind of ties in with that. What sets the Belgians apart? What do they do that makes their chocolate so unique and wonderful? They, they are very, very good at grinding. So those guys grind like crazy. The, the, the particle size, uh, once you get below about 50 microns, particle size when you put something in your mouth, you no longer perceive grittiness, right? So let's imagine this. If we took coffee beans and we crunch them up in our teeth, that's very gritty. If we grind them very finely, okay, that sort of tastes like a powder. And if we keep on grinding, especially in the case of cocoa, we can keep grinding and the fat is released, it ceases to taste like a powder and it begins to taste like chocolate. And, and that occurs below 50 microns. Now, the Belgians and the Swiss, those guys really like to grind, and their style of chocolate is something that's, that's, that's grind down, ground down to somewhere around eight, nine microns uh, in size. Those are very, very fine particles. Imagine grinding your coffee to eight or nine microns. I mean, that's, that's just a crazily fine grind. Uh, it's a style uh, that produces a very creamy texture. And they also do a fair amount of work in their conching too, so there's a lot of emulsifying going on. And they tend to use, they have a different philosophy on additives in food. They use slightly different ones. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, um, but they, 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 they have a tendency to go from this very sort of creamy style. Does that answer? It's basically grinding size, basically the, uh, how finely ground it is. Can we thank our speaker again, please? Yeah. For the next one? And again, if you need the extra credit, it's at the stand at the front of the door, and there are chocolate samples out in the lobby as well. Thank you all again for coming.